from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! We're broadcasting from Chicago outside the NATO summit. My name is Scott Olson. I have with me today, today I have with me my Global War on Terror Medal, Operation Iraqi Freedom Medal, National Defense Medal, and Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal. These medals, once upon a time, made me feel good about what I was doing. They made me feel like I was doing the right thing. And I came back to reality, and I don't want these anymore. Saying no to NATO, more than 40 veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars hurled their medals Sunday toward the gate of the NATO summit in Chicago. Among them, Scott Olson. He survived two tours in Iraq, but almost died when he was hit with a police projectile at an Occupy Oakland protest. We'll also hear voices from the streets of the NATO protests, including musician and activist Tom Morello and civil rights leader Jesse Jackson. We ventured into Iraq on the wrong target. Three trillion dollars in lives and money lost. What could a trillion dollars do today? Why would they state budget deficit? The 750,000 public workers lost could get their jobs back. So it, it, the misadventure is very costly. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Dozens of people have been killed in a suicide bombing in the Yemeni capital of Sana'a. Early reports say around 100 have died, but the death toll could rise. The bomber was reportedly dressed in a military uniform and targeted a military parade. Al-Qaeda has claimed responsibility for the attack. Thousands of people marched in Chicago on Sunday in the largest demonstration so far against the NATO summit. The Chicago police have been criticized by activist groups for using violent force to break up protests. On Saturday, a police van was videotaped nearly running over a protester. Dozens of protesters have been arrested over the past two days. The Chicago police have also been accused of targeting independent media activists who have been streaming the protests live over the Internet. On Saturday night, police detained three live streamers at gunpoint. At the end of Sunday's march, Iraq veterans against the war held a ceremony where nearly 50 veterans discarded their war medals by hurling them in the direction of the NATO summit. That these medals were given to them in many instances for creating essentially unforgivable acts, inflicting pain on innocent civilians in most cases. This is just to demonstrate that uh, the current operations are not working. Um, you know, I came to a conclusion that there is no such thing as war on terrorism. What we're doing is waging war against the people of Afghanistan, uh, which are resulting into joining the Taliban. Before the weekend began, three activists were arrested on terrorism charges for an alleged plot to attack President Obama's campaign headquarters and other sites around Chicago during the NATO summit. Jared Chase, Brent Betterly, and Brian Jacob Church are accused of conspiracy to commit terrorism, material support for terrorism, and possession of explosives. Police say they recovered materials for making Molotov cocktails in a raid last week. But attorneys for the so-called NATO-3 say they were set up by government informants who planted the explosives. Supporters also say police seized equipment that was used for brewing homemade beer. Michael Deutsch, an attorney for the protesters with the National Lawyers Guild, accused Chicago police of entrapment. Obviously, we don't have access to all the information that the state has. But what we do know is, is that there were police, undercover police officers that ingratiated themselves with people who come from out of town. And from our information, the so-called incendiary devices and the plans to attack police stations, attack the mayor's office, is all coming from the mind of the police informants and are not coming 
from our clients who are nonviolent protesters. They're not anarchists. They don't belong to a black box organization. They're involved with nonviolent protests. And what we believe is, is that this is a way to stir up prejudice against the people who are exercising their First Amendment rights. On Sunday, two more activists were charged with terror-related allegations, one with threatening to blow up a downtown bridge and a second with seeking to build pipe bombs. Police say the alleged plots were in the planning stages and no explosives were recovered. After headlines, we'll go to the streets of the NATO summit to hear more of the protests. In other news from the Chicago summit, NATO leaders have approved the first phase of a U.S.-led so-called missile defense shield to be deployed in Europe. The plan will deploy a U.S. warship armed with interceptors in the Mediterranean, as well as a radar system in a German base. Russia has condemned the move and threatened to station rockets in areas bordering the European Union. The U.N.'s top nuclear oversight official has arrived in Tehran for talks with the Iranian government. The visit from International Atomic Energy Agency chief Yukei Amano comes ahead of a key summit in Baghdad between Iran and world powers, including the U.S., later this week. Ahead of his visit, Amano said he's optimistic that a new framework for monitoring Iran's nuclear sites can be reached. We need to keep up the momentum. There has been good progress during the recent round of discussions between Iran and IAEA. So I thought that now is the right time for me to visit Tehran and have a direct talk with high-level officials of Iran. The Republican-controlled House has approved a new military policy bill that would increase spending limits for the Pentagon while upholding indefinite detention. Under the National Defense Authorization Act for the upcoming fiscal year, the U.S. would allocate $642 billion for the Pentagon, exceeding congressionally mandated spending limits by $8 billion. The New York Times notes the bill, quote, makes clear House Republicans and many Democrats are opposed to including the Pentagon in the coming era of fiscal austerity. In approving the measure, lawmakers also reject an amendment that would have barred the indefinite detention of suspects seized on U.S. soil. Alabama Governor Robert Bentley has signed into law a harsher version of the state's notorious anti-immigrant law, despite publicly calling for its revision. The measure would preserve original provisions, including the requirement that schools check enrolling students' immigration status, while adding new regulations mandating the publication of the names and photographs of undocumented immigrants who appear in court. Governor Bentley signed the new measure into law on Friday, just one day after he called for a special legislative session to make changes. The board of directors of the NAACP has voted for the first time to endorse same-sex marriage. The move follows President Obama's endorsement of gay marriage earlier this month and speculation over whether that would hurt his standing among some African-American voters. In a statement, NAACP President Ben Jealous said, quote, civil marriage is a civil right and a matter of civil law. The well-funded right-wing organizations who are attempting to split our communities are no friend to civil rights, and they will not succeed, he said. And tens of thousands took to the streets in the Canadian province of Quebec over the weekend to protest the provincial government's latest efforts to end a three-month student strike. On Friday, Quebec lawmakers passed an emergency law requiring demonstrators to inform police of any protest route involving 50 or more people. The measure also bars the wearing of masks at protests. Those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Chicago, site of the largest NATO summit in the organization's 63-year history. While delegates from 60 nations are meeting in the heavily secured McCormick Place Convention Center, thousands of anti-war protesters have been in the streets. On Sunday, protesters marched from Grant Park to near the NATO summit. The march marked the largest protest in a week-long series of actions against the NATO summit. The march was led by veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, as well as members of Afghans for Peace. 
At the end of the march, Iraq Veterans Against the War held a ceremony where more than 40 veterans discarded their war medals by hurling them in the direction of the NATO summit. Vietnam veterans staged a similar protest outside the U.S. Capitol in 1971. On Sunday, former U.S. Army Sergeant Alejandro Viatoro served during the Iraq 2003 invasion and in Afghanistan in 2011. No NATO, no war. No NATO, no war. We don't work for you no more. We don't work for you no more. N A T O. N A T O. We don't kill for you no more. We don't kill for you no more. At this time, one by one, veterans of the wars of NATO will walk up on stage. They will tell us why they chose to return their medals to NATO. I urge you to honor them by listening to their stories. Nowhere else will you hear from so many who fought these wars about their journey from fighting a war to de demanding peace. Some of us killed innocents. Some of us helped in continuing these wars from home. Some of us watched our friends die. Some of us are, are not here because we took our own lives. We did not get the care promised to us by our government. All of us watched failed policies turn into bloodshed. Listen to us, hear us, and think, was any of this worth it? Do these medals thank us for a job well done? Do they mask lies, corruption, and abuse of young men and women who swore to defend their country? We tear off this mask. Hear us. My name is Iris Feliciano. I served in the Marine Corps, and in January of 2002, I deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. And I want to tell the folks behind us in these uh, enclosed walls where they build more policies based on lies and fear that we no longer stand for them. We no longer stand for their lies, their failed policies, and these unjust wars. Bring our troops home and end the war now. They can have these back. My name is Greg Miller. I'm a veteran of the United States Army Infantry with service in Iraq 2009. The military hands out cheap tokens like this to soldiers, service members, in an attempt to fill the void where their conscience used to be once they indoctrinated out of you. But that didn't work on me, so I'm here to return my Global War on Terrorism Medal and my National Defense Medal because they're both lies. My name's Scott Kimball. I'm an Iraq War vet. And I'm turning in these medals today for the people of Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, and all victims of occupation across the world. And also, for all the service members and veterans who are against these wars, you are not alone! My name is Christopher May. Uh, I left the Army as a conscientious objector. <laughs> We were told that these medals represented, uh, you know, democracy and justice and uh, hope and change for the world. These medals represent a failure on behalf of the leaders of NATO to accurately represent the will of their own people. It represents a failure on the leaders of NATO to do what's right by the disenfranchised people of this world. Instead of helping them, they take advantage of them, and they're making things worse. I will not be a part of that anymore. These medals don't mean anything to me, and they can have them back. My name is Ash Wilson. I was a sergeant. I was in Iraq in 03, and what I saw there crushed me. I don't want us to suffer this again, and I don't want our children to suffer this again. So I'm giving these back. sergeant in the army. I did two tours in Iraq. No amount of medals, ribbons, or flags can cover the amount of human suffering caused by these wars. We don't want this garbage. We want our human rights. We want our right to heal. I'm Jacob Crawford. I went to Iraq and Afghanistan. And when they gave me these medals, I knew they were meaningless. I only regret not starting to speak up about how silly the war is sooner. I'm giving these back. Free Bradley Manning. Yeah. 
My name is Jason Hurd. I spent 10 years in the United States Army as a combat medic. I deployed to Baghdad in 2004. I'm here to return my Global War on Terrorism Service Medal in solidarity with the people of Iraq and the people of Afghanistan. I am deeply sorry for the destruction that we have caused in those countries and around the globe. I am proud to stand on this stage with my fellow veterans and my Afghan sisters. These were lies. I'm giving them back. My name is Stephen Lund. I'm a two-time Iraq combat veteran. This medal I'm dedicating to the children of Iraq that no longer have fathers and mothers. My name is Sean and I was a nuclear biological chemical specialist for a war that didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. So I deserted. I'm one of 40,000 people that left the United States Armed Forces because this is a lie. My name is Steve Ashton. I'm from Campbellsport, Wisconsin. I was a forward observer in the United States Army for just under five years. I deployed to Sadr City, Iraq in 2005, and I'm giving back my medals for the children of Iraq and Afghanistan. May they be, they be able to forgive us for what we've done to them. May we begin to heal, and may we, may we live in peace from here until eternity. My name is Michael Thurman. I was a conscientious objector from the United States Air Force. I'm returning my Global War on Terrorism medal and my military coins on behalf of Private First Class Bradley Manning, who sacrificed everything to show us the truth about these wars. My name is Matt Howard. I served in the United States Marine Corps from 2001 to 2006 and in Iraq twice. I'm turning in my campaign service, Iraq Campaign Service Medal and Global War on Terror Service and Expeditionary Medals for all my brothers and sisters affected with traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder. My name is Zach Laporte, and I'm an Iraq War veteran from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm giving back my medals today because I feel like I was duped into uh, a, a, an illegal war that was that was sold to me on the guys that I was going to be liberating the Iraqi people when instead of liberating the people I was liberating their oil fields My name is Scott Olson I have with me today today I have with me my Global War on Terror Medal Operation Iraqi Freedom Medal, National Defense Medal, and Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal. These medals, once upon a time, made me feel good about what I was doing. They made me feel like I was doing the right thing. And I came back to reality, and I don't want these anymore. My name is Todd Dennis. I served in the United States Navy. I have PTSD. I'm returning my Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal because it was given to me uh, according to my letter because of hard work and dedication and setting the example. I was a hard worker because I buried my PTSD and overworked myself in the military. And I'm throwing this back and invoking my right to heal. <laughs> My name is Michael Applegate. I was in the United States Navy from 1998 to 2006, and I'm returning my medal today because I want to live by my conscience rather than being a prisoner of it. My name is Nate. I served in the U.S. Navy from 99 to 2003 and participated in the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. I was wrong to uh, sign myself up for that. I apologize to the Iraqi and Afghani people for destroying your countries. My name is Brock McIntosh. I was in the Army National Guard and served in Afghanistan from November 08 to August 09. Two months ago, I visited the monument at Ground Zero for my first time with two Afghans, the tragic monument. I'm going to toss this medal today for the 33,000 civilians who died in Afghanistan that won't have a monument built for them. And this is for the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. My name is Vincent Angoli and I serve with the United States Marine Corps. 
First and foremost, this is for the people of Iraq and Afghanistan. Second of all, this is for our real forefathers. I'm talking about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I'm talking about the Black Panthers. I'm talking about the Civil Rights Movement. I'm talking about unions. I'm talking about our socialist brothers and sisters, our communist brothers and sisters, our anarchist brothers and sisters, and our ecology brothers and sisters. That's who our real forefathers are. And lastly, and lastly, and most importantly, our enemies are not 7,000 miles from home. They sit in boardrooms. They are CEOs. They are bankers. They are hedge fund managers. They do not live 7,000 miles from home. Our enemies are right here, and we look at them every day. They are not the men and women who are standing on this police line. They are the millionaires and billionaires who control this planet, and we've had enough of it. So they can take their medals back. My name is Chuck Weinert. I'm here on behalf of six good Americans who really wanted to be here, but they couldn't be. They couldn't be because when they came to the U.S. border, they'd be immediately arrested. And the crime they'd be arrested for was refusing to continue to participate in the crimes against the people of Iraq and Afghanistan. And these good Americans who are exiled now from this country, who, de who deserve amnesty, are Private Christian Carr of the U.S. Marine Corps. Private Kim Rivera, Army, Combat Action Band, refused redeployment to Iraq. Yeah. Corporal Jeremy Brockway, U.S. Marine Corps, Combat Action Band, refused redeployment to Iraq. Yeah. Specialist Jules Tim Duncan, Combat Infantryman's Band, Paratrooper, refused redeployment to Afghanistan. Yeah. Sergeant Corey Glass, Army, refused redeployment to Iraq. And Sergeant Chris Vesey, paratrooper, CIB, refused redeployment to Afghanistan. I have their awards in my pocket, and I'm throwing them back mad as hell. My name is Aaron Hughes. I served in the Illinois Army National Guard from 2000 to 2006. This medal right here is for Anthony Wagner. He died last year. This medal right here is for the one-third of the women in the military that are sexually assaulted by their peers. We talk about standing up for our sisters. We talk about standing up for our sisters in Afghanistan. We can't even take care of our sisters here. And this medal right here is because I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all of you. I'm sorry. Members of Iraq veterans against the war throwing away their war medals outside the NATO summit here in Chicago. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, back in a minute. Black leather boots, spit shine so bright, I cut off my hair, but it looks so right. We marched down with sand. We all became friends as we learned how to fight. A hero of war, yeah, that's what I'll be. And when I come home, they'll be damn proud of me. I carry this flag to the grave if I must. But it's a fight that I love and a fight. I trust I kicked in the door I yelled my command The children they cried But I got my man We took him away A bag over his face From his family he and his friends They took off his clothes Tim McGillrath of the band Rise Against, singing the song Hero of War, at the rally outside the NATO summit here in Chicago on Sunday. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Among the members of Iraq Veterans Against the War, who threw away their war medals outside the NATO summit here in Chicago, 
threw them to the NATO generals, they said, was Lance Corporal Scott Olson. He is the young activist who, after returning from Iraq, got involved with the Occupy movement and, in Oakland, California, was hit by a police projectile that almost took his life. It's fractured his skull. After he threw his medals towards the fence of the NATO summit, I sat down with him as he was marching in the protest. He was wearing a black helmet that protects his head, since he has had a fractured skull. This is some of what Scott Olson had to say. My name is um, I came here to to Chicago to return my medals to NATO um, and to be there for my other brothers and sisters who went to the same thing as I did. Um, and right. returning those medals, okay. um, I think, was was a big step for all of us to take, and um, it was a step that we all had to take th together. What medal did you return? I returned four medals. I returned um, the Global War on Terror medal, the um, Operation Iraqi Freedom medal, the National Defense medal, and the Marine Corps Good Conduct medal. That's a lot of medals. Yes. You served two tours of duty in Iraq? That's correct. When did you enlist and when did you go to Iraq? I, I enlisted uh, shortly after I I uh, graduated high school in 2005. Um, and, uh, in Wisconsin? Yes. And in 2006, I went to Iraq uh, for my first time, and we were extended to save for the surge. And then I went again in 2008. And what was your experience like? My experience in Iraq, um, you know, it was really, uh, it, it, it wasn't right. Like, you know, I, I thought that we were over there doing good things and helping these people have a democracy and have a functional country and at the same time protecting our country. But, you know, every day I spent over there, I found out that that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, I didn't see us really doing any, any good work. We weren't doing anything that we said we were going to do. And, you know, instead we killed hundreds of thousands of civilians and we tore their nation apart. So when you came back after the second time, what did you decide to do? Um, well, I decided that I was, you know, there was no way I was going to re-enlist. I wasn't going to participate in the system anymore. And um, yeah. And so let's talk about the second part of this journey where you ended up at Occupy in right. Oakland. Yeah. Um, after I got out, I found uh, Iraq veterans against the war, and I started participating in actions with them, and you know, really making friends with other veterans who thought the same way as I did. So I went up there to the Wisconsin protests last year, and um, that really radicalized me and made me see that you know the true power power of being part of a community that's trying to change things for the better and i saw occupy as the next step after that as a continuance of that and it's something that i was waiting for and i think it's something that a lot of people were waiting for and so what happened to you at occupy uh October 25th, I went to a uh, protest in Oakland uh, at night, and you know these people have just been removed from their encampment, and I thought that we had a right to be there. I thought that we had the right to have our voices heard there. So I went there, and uh, a police officer shot me in the head with a beanbag round, and it fractured my skull. Um, Did you see the officer? I did not. Um, it, it came out of nowhere. It came from my side, and um, you know. The, How do you know it was being bad? Uh, we, we had a test done, and the test results revealed that the pattern was consistent with what it would be if it were a beanbag round. So that confirmed it. And so you ended up in the hospital. And how long were you in the hospital? And how long were you able? Uh, so you had a fractured skull. 
Right. So, so I went to the hospital. I was in the hospital for two and a half weeks. Um, I, I could not talk while I was in the hospital and, until the last few, few days when I regained that, starting to be able to talk again. Um, and. Uh, I had neurosurgery and uh, skull reconstruction surgery, so it was a very, you know, hard to be in the hospital, and it was it was a lot to go through. Um, but I'm really, I'm really glad that I really committed myself to getting better. So, how did you go from Occupy Oakland, the hospital rehab, to this NATO summit, and willing to face whatever you would face here? Well, I, I'm I'm really not going to let their actions stop me, um, and you know I'm not going to let my, that stop me and keep me home. I'm going to make make every effort I can um, to show them that we're doing the right thing. We're in the right, and no matter what they do to any of us, we've got each other's backs, and we're going forward. And to see the police and the riot police with their helmets, the uh, police officers on horseback. I mean, that that still always gets to me. I mean, they're always trying to intimidate us and, you know, keep, keep our numbers down, keep families home. You know, people don't want to bring out kids when there's a threat of violence. So that's what that represents to me. And. Um, and that's why I was wearing my helmet today. Um, you know, I, I can't be too safe. You know, anything could happen, and you know. Um, you were wearing a black shiny helmet. Right. I was I was wearing a helmet for my safety, and I have to do that every time I go to a protest where there's a threat of violence from the police. Because. I, well, because. Um, they have been using violence across the country, and they still do, and people are still getting hurt. And, and if you got hit again in the head? Right. I, since I had a recent brain injury, another hit would probably be, be deadly or cause much more damage, so I really can't take that risk. Lance Corporal Scott Olson of Iraq Veterans Against the War, speaking Sunday after he threw his war medals towards the gate of the NATO summit, among more than 40 other veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, protesting the NATO summit. Sunday's march was led by members of Iraq Vets Against the War and women from Afghans for Peace. Shortly before the march, I had a chance to conduct a joint interview with a member of each group. Sahar, I'm representing Afghans for Peace. We're a global Afghan-led peace movement, uh, speaking out against the occupation and war in Afghanistan. And we're here to uh, protest uh, NATO and, and call on all NATO representatives to end this inhumane, illegal, barbaric war against our home country and our people. And you are standing next to? I'm Graham Klempner. I was a United States Army Ranger. I spent three years in the military and deployed to Afghanistan. When were you in Afghanistan? 2005-2006. So how do you feel standing next to a soldier? Where were you in Afghanistan? Uh, Isadabad in the Jalalabad area. Where is your family from? My family is from uh, well, four different provinces, Lahman, Kabul, Logar, Badakhshan. I was born in Kabul. And I left Afghanistan in 1988 as a refugee from the Soviet war. And here you're standing next to a U.S. soldier. Absolutely. And I feel honored standing next to this uh, veteran, Graham, uh, because uh, they're now, I, I believe, in my uh, opinion, doing what, doing the right thing and speaking out against uh, the occupation and war alongside us today. And so we will be marching with them at the rally, and uh, we will be with them during the re reconciliation um, event uh, towards the end as well. As we speak here, uh, right near the NATO summit, Amnesty International is holding a, what they're calling an alternative summit, but Madeleine Albright is addressing them, and they have these ads up now that um, basically congratulate NATO and talk about continue the progress with women in Afghanistan. What is your response to that? No, I think that that's abs an absolute ridiculous joke. Uh, they are not there to liberate Afghanist uh, Afghanistan's women. You cannot liberate women through occupation, through war, through violence, through bombs, through tanks, through weapons. That's not how you do it. And it's, it's quite offensive to me as, as an Afghan woman standing here before you. How do you do it? 
they need to be empowered. They, they need, we need to refocus our priorities on their basic human needs, education, health care. Um, uh, well, education and health care would be the top two, and also we need to focus on, on reconciliation efforts and, and uh, uh, reparations as well. When did you sign up for the military? I signed up after 9-11 in the summer of 2003. And when did your views start changing about what you were doing in Afghanistan? Well, it was during the deployment. I mean, we saw uh, that what we were seeing on television when we sit in the chow hall uh, about the war uh, was much different from the reality on the ground. And we were taking casualties on a weekly basis, and we were seeing other units do the same. Uh, we could also see that when we entered a home, uh, even if there wasn't a terrorist there before, there was when we left. And we were radicalizing the entire population just by our presence. You were wearing a medal. What is the medal for? This is the Global War on Terrorism medal. Anybody who serves uh, post 9-11 in the United States military serves in the Global War on an adjective. What are you doing with it today? I'm going to be turning it back into the generals at NATO to demonstrate that I reject the medal. I reject what it means, and I reject uh, any affiliation with this war. Why? This war... Like that plane out of bio. It's changed so many lives, and it's changed my own, and it's changed hers and so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and it's not accomplishing the original goals. I joined because I wanted to help women. I wanted to uh, be the patriarchal savior who came in and fixed the problems, and I didn't understand that uh, I was actually the one making the problems worse. And what is the reconciliation that will happen today between U.S. military and Afghans for peace? Go ahead. Well, uh, part of this whole process is starting the process of reconciliation, which means that we're actually listening to each other. We practice active listening, hearing where the other people are coming from. Uh, we have a long way to go to come together and, and for us to overcome a lot of the guilt and a lot of the shame that we as soldiers and veterans feel for what we participated in. And we want to start creating instead of destroying. And it's the first time an Afghan-led peace movement is now working side by side with a veteran-led peace movement. And so this is how, this is the beginning of, of of, of something new, something, something better, so reconciliation and peace. Afghans for Peace and Graham Klumpner, who served in Afghanistan. They were part of a reconciliation ceremony that concluded the march on the NATO summit. Graham Klumpner went on to throw his war medals at the NATO summit gate, along with more than 40 other veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Protesters are heading to the headquarters of Boeing today here in Chicago, capping off a week of protests against the NATO summit. On Friday, the National Nurses United held a march in downtown Chicago. Kay McKay, a retired nurse, condemned austerity cuts. We do have to come together. I don't care what the color of skin or what language they talk. When you cut, you bleed blood, not gold. On Saturday, hundreds of protesters marched to the home of Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, President Obama's former chief of staff. Activists criticized Emanuel for cutting funding for social services while funding a massive security operation during the NATO summit. My name is Zakiya S. Muhammad, and I am a community activist here in Chicago and wherever else that I'm needed. I am standing with the health care advocates today because Ron Emanuel has cut the clinics, taken away service, and I am for uh, those that are against cuts. about to cut the job title that I'm in, uh, home care providers. They're trying to cut home care providers, those of us that provide services to disabled and seniors that would normally be in a, a senior uh, building, uh, out of a senior building into a nursing home. We're trying to keep them in senior buildings so they won't have to go to nursing homes. They are cutting child care providers. Right now, child care providers have not gotten paid in six months because Ron Emanuel 
Israel, and the governor has taken the money to put in the street for construction so uh, other people can have jobs that don't look like us. So I am uh, against all cuts all over this city, all over this world. Mental health is a human right, and there should be mental health clinics in all of our communities. Okay. Dozens of protesters have also been arrested over the past several days, including five men who were jailed on domestic terrorism charges. Three of the men were accused of plotting to attack President Obama's campaign headquarters, Mayor Rahm Emanuel's home, and other targets. The arrests of the men dominated the news coverage here in Chicago leading up to Sunday's march. Lawyers for the men say they were entrapped by government informants. Michael Deutsch is an attorney with the National Lawyers Guild. Obviously, we don't have access to all the information that the state has. But what we do know is, is that there were police, undercover police officers that ingratiated themselves with people who come from out of town. And from our information, the so-called incendiary devices and the plans to attack police stations, attack the mayor's office, is all coming from the mind of the police informants and are not coming from our clients who are nonviolent protesters. They're not anarchists. They don't belong to a black box organization. They're involved with nonviolent protests. And what we believe is, is that this is a way to stir up prejudice against the people who are exercising their First Amendment rights. The Chicago police have also been criticized by activist groups for using violent force to break up protests. On Saturday, a police van was videotaped nearly running over a protester. Mark Provost of Occupy Boston and Occupy New Hampshire witnessed the incident. Witnessed a young woman hit by a, a, a police van, and then he subsequently attempted to run over a protester for approximately 40 yards down a hill, going 10 to 12 miles an hour, uh, not staggered, but fully 10 to 12 miles an hour. I, I've never witnessed such violence in my life. What happened to these protesters? The, the, the woman was hospitalized, and the man only escaped unscathed thanks to the fact that he was six foot seven. So you saw the police van run into this protester. Describe exactly what you saw happen. What I saw happen was I was texting as usual, and uh, I basically heard a lot of screaming. I looked up, and 15 feet in front of me, without anybody in between, I saw a van heading right towards me with a man in front of it. Half of his body, his torso, and his arms were on the hood, and he was scrambling with his feet. And from what I could tell, the, car, the van was going so fast that he couldn't go to the side or the wheels would have ran him over. On Sunday, police beat back protesters who attempted to march toward McCormick Place, the heavily fortified site of the NATO summit. I talked to one protester who had just lost parts of both of his front teeth after he was hit by a police officer. Uh, I, they were, we were pushing that way, uh, and they started knocking people back. Um, a girl fell down, and they continued to beat her on her legs and on her body. Um, and uh, she, they kept saying, get back, get back. And she was like, I can't, I can't get up. Uh, a man tried to go and pick her up. They hit him on the back of the head. He fell down. He started bleeding. Um, and then I was trying to pick her up. I kind of fell on my knees, and they took a billy club, and they just rammed it right into my teeth. What are you going to do about your teeth? Uh, I don't have health insurance. I'm going to. There's a Dearborn clinic that uh, the medics told me about. They gave me a piece of paper. Uh, I'm going there and see what can happen. Hopefully, there'll be a lawsuit and I'll get a bunch of money. Okay, were you able to find the pieces of your teeth? Yeah, they were in my mouth. I spit them out there in a bottle of water in my backpack now. The Chicago police have also been accused of targeting independent media activists who have been streaming the protests live over the Internet. On Saturday night, police detained three live streamers at gunpoint. Luke Rakowski of WeAreChanged.org described what happened. A large number of police vehicles, undercover vehicles, CPD vehicles, three white shirt lieutenants uh, pulled up right in front of us. Guns were drawn, uh, screaming at us to get our hands up. We're being raided right now. For those that are watching, we are being raided by the CPD as we speak. I immediately took my hands out, but with a cell phone in one hand. I was recording the whole thing on Ustream with officers coming up to us with guns pointed, and they were screaming, it's just a cell phone, don't shoot. They repeated that about five times. Uh, they took my cell phone, threw it on the roof, 
took us out of the car, put us in handcuffs, asked, them some que asked us some questions, took down all of our information, started banging our hard drives, our camera equipment, our batteries. Uh, I think one of our uh, hard drives may be uh, destroyed from the banging that the officers did to it. Uh, I was talking to one of the lieutenants, and he said, we're just looking for a vehicle that's similar to this. We drive uh, 99 Lexus with New Mexico plates. I don't think there's many New Mexico plates here in Chicago, especially matching that description of that vehicle. Uh, and when he said that, he looked down when I was making eye contact and started laughing. But why do you think the police are so threatened by what you do? I have no idea. I mean, what do we? What we do is provide a service to the people. We stream live, raw, unedited for everybody to see and make up their own mind. Uh, we're not. We're here to That's document. That's Luke Ritkowski of WeAreChange.org. This is Democracy Now. DemocracyNow.org. The War and Peace Report. We're in Chicago. Back in a minute. Was Toshi Reagan singing Woody Guthrie's This Train is Bound for Glory, recorded live Saturday night at a concert organized by Porta Luz here in Chicago, marking Woody Guthrie's centennial, also marking the protests at the NATO summit. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Chicago. German delegates from more than, well, delegates from more than 60 countries are taking part in this year's NATO summit here in Chicago. Meanwhile, many international peace activists have also traveled to the United States to take part in the protests. My name is Reinhard Braun. I'm coming from Germany. I'm the executive director of the International Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms and the chairperson of the international coalition No to War, No to NATO. I'm here to protest against, against the dinosauria, a ref reflection of the Cold War period. We do not need NATO any longer because the old enemy of the NATO, the Russia, pact is over, but NATO still continues. It spends one trillion dollar per year, and we need these money for jobs, for healthcare system, for education. So we really have to overcome NATO. NATO for us is the biggest military alliance in the world, which make wars, not only in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq and other places. And we need peaceful conflict solutions and alternatives to war. And this is the reason we are here and protesting with our American fr friends, with our sisters and brothers here against this huge NATO summit in Chicago. Now, NATO leaders, presidents, generals, argue that multilateralism is important. For example, they say they're here to figure out a way to eventually end the war in Afghanistan. Your response to that? You know, 2014, this means more than two years. In the last two years, about more than 5,000 people, soldiers died, and about 25,000 civilians died. I think we cannot wait again for two, long, two years longer till the troops come home. I think the idea of the French president immediately to start withdrawing the troops, this is the right idea, and we are supporting these ideas. We think the troops should come home immediately and so quick as possible. What we need is a negotiation process in Afghanistan, in the region. All parties in Afghanistan, including the Taliban, have to sit together at one table, negotiate a peace process, and we need the same with the countries around the countries in the region. It's interesting, right after the socialist president of France, uh, Francois Hollande, was inaugurated, his, one of his first acts was to go to Germany to meet with your president, with Ang uh, Angela Merkel. 
Why? And what about uh, the approach that Germany is taking? You know, historically, we have close relations to France. And by the history of these two common countries, this is a big, big success. You know, we had wars between Germany and France for hundreds of years. So it's a big success. We are now peaceful neighbors. They are coming together to find a solution for the economic crisis in Europe, austerity solution, which is not our solution. But Merkel also wants to convince Hollande to give up his plans for bringing the troops home in the beginning of 2012. And this we absolutely disagree. So I am so happy that Hollande at the press conference next to the President of the United States underlined his idea to bring the troops from Afghanistan home in 2012. This is a big step forward to peace in Afghanistan. What is an alternative to NATO? The alternative to NATO is a common security project in Europe and between Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. Having in mind that we have to solve common economic, common social, common environmental program. For this we need a huge amount of money, so we have to reduce the military budget tremendously to have this money for peaceful and social affairs. German peace activist Reiner Braun from Berlin, also at the NATO summit. Uh, he participated in an alternative summit and protested the NATO summit. Among those who were also there was musician and activist Tom Morello, who has performed at a number of rallies and concerts here in Chicago over the past three days. I caught up with him after he performed at the anti-war rally in Grant Park. This land is I was asked by Iraq and Afghanistan veterans against the war to perform today, and I've uh, done many solidarity actions with them through the years. I was very happy and pleased to be here. What about these soldiers who are about to return their medals? I know that it is not easy for many of them mm -hmm. or their families. I, know the, I think there's nothing more courageous than a soldier who stands up against an unjust war, and that's what these uh, soldiers are doing. Very brave soldiers, courageous soldiers are doing today. And the role of music and art in resistance. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, what music can do is it can help steal the backbone of those in the midst of a struggle, help with wind in the sails of uh, social justice movements. And I've been here over the course of the last three days exhaustively playing songs for a variety of uh, causes, but uh, none more uh, important than today. What links do you make between you're going to be soon headed to Wisconsin uh, for the race for governor? You'll yeah. be performing in uh, Madison and other places. And here you are at the NATO summit. What are the links? Well, if only we could recall NATO would be <laughs> uh, would be or the G8 uh, those those unaccountable bodies though are currently not within the, the, the spectrum of what we can recall but uh, you know ac across the globe and certainly across the United States from the from this uh, veterans against the war movement to the union you know the, the rising the boomeranging back around union movement uh, social justice movements are on the rise again and my I hope to some small degree that my songs can help be a soundtrack for that struggle and to help people um, on the front lines and what do you say to those who say, but NATO represents a multilateral approach to dealing with war? Well, I would, I mean, the first person I would try, people that I would try to explain that to are the civilians who have lost family members from NATO's, you know, generous actions around the globe. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 there have been unforgivable war crimes that have occurred over the course of the last decade at NATO's, on NATO's bloody hands. That's what these veterans here are, have come to express, and they're going to return their medals because of that. What are you going to be performing today? It's still, there's still some discussion and debate about what's going to be performed, but I have a, a, a small catalog of uh, songs that, are, that I've written for uh, uh, veterans, uh, Iraq veterans against the war. I'm going to start with those. So one of them is called Battle Hymns. Uh, one of them is called Stray Bullets. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey. This is uh, uh, a song I wrote for Thomas Young, who's a disabled uh, uh, Iraq veteran, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, who's in Iraq for five days before his spine was severed by bullets. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's kind of a, it, it, having spent some time talking with him about it and the, the very conflicted feelings he has about uh, what patriotism means when you've given everything for a war that you don't believe in. So here you are um, in 
Chicago, not that far probably from where President Obama is. This is his hometown. We made sure. Hometown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are staying yeah. at the same hotel. Yeah, so I understand. So the Secret Service would have me understand. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Um, which hotel is that? Yeah. What's that? Which hotel is the that? Sheraton. Uh -huh. The Sheraton. Uh-huh. Very interesting. You won't get near it. So did anyone confuse the two of you? Because you know it's possible. I hope to share an elevator with him at some point. Talk just, about your background. Yeah, well, I mean, we're both, we both have Kenyan fathers and white American mothers, and we both attended Harvard University at the same time. He was in law school while I was an undergrad, and we're both from Illinois. And we're both pretty good basketball players, too, So uh, though our politics may differ. And have you ever met? No, we've never met. What would you say to President Obama if you met him in the elevator? I'd like to see him in the pit of a Rage Against the Machine show. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> Let's see if he's really down with the people. <laughs> and as for NATO? As for NATO, ah, well, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think that, that I always have the strong conviction that change comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. And so it's what we do in the streets and the kind of mass movements that we can mobilize that are going to not just, that are going to demand change as opposed to, you know, begging elected officials to do something on our behalf. arrested here, the raids we're hearing about that are happening in the afternoon, in the night, the people, young people who are being charged with terrorism. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, none of that should come as any surprise. I mean, this is uh, <coughs> the, the, the message that is being presented here by the protesters is one that's very, very threatening to the moneyed interests who, you know, back NATO, who back the G8. And so, uh, you know, I think that we haven't seen the last of the repressive measures this weekend. Musician Tom Morello, also at the anti-NATO protest, was the Reverend Jesse Jackson of Rainbow Push Coalition, which is based here in Chicago. I asked him about the significance of the NATO summit and the protests. You know, people are here from around the world searching for, searching for alternatives to war. Uh, war seems to be expanding. People seem to have accepted NATO as a defensive organization, defense against Soviet expansion in the Europe allowing Europe to restabilize it has and to keep the uh, Germans from rearming. So the Soviet Union is gone. Germany is now an ally. Europe is stable again in the military and in, in the economic sense. Uh, but here we are today. Uh, we, we went we ventured into Iraq on the wrong target. Three trillion dollars in lives and money lost. What could a trillion dollars do today? Why would every state budget deficit? The 750,000 public workers lost could get their jobs back. So it, it, the misadventure is very costly. Now we seek to go in to expand a long-term commitment to Afghanistan, two to four billion dollars a week. When we're laying off transfer workers, closing schools and closing hospitals, we can't afford it. It, it is a mission not worthy of the investment. I hope people who are here today will remain nonviolent and discipline and focus. The media would rather cover a brick than to cover the message. When, when the nurses say health care, not warfare, that's the message. When the veterans say when we come home, we come home to a home. The veterans deserve a, a lifetime health care, a place to stay, a job and education. That message should not be lost. And if that message is affirmed, I think American people will embrace that message. The Reverend Jesse Jackson of the Rainbow Push Coalition, based here in Chicago. And that does it for our broadcast. If you'd like to get a copy, you can go to our website at democracynow.org, where the transcripts of the whole show will be up, as well as the video and audio uh, podcasts. Tell your friends. They can go to democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by a remarkable team. Our crew here in Chicago, Mike Burke, Hani Massoud, Dennis Moynihan, and John Hamilton. In New York, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermeen Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Sam Alcoff, Robbie Karen, Dina Guzder, Chantal Berman, Amy Littlefield. Mike DeFilippo and Miguel Nagara are our engineers. A special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Hugh Grant, Jessica Lee, and John Wallach. Tomorrow on Tuesday after the broadcast in New York, I'll be headed to Boston. Look forward to seeing folks there. I'll be speaking along with Harry Belafonte. You can